Thank you, and thank you for bearing with me as we got this microphone set up. I was telling Professor Bird I've been traveling so much that my voice is perpetually a little bit hoarse, and I was afraid that it might crack in the middle of trying to read to you tonight. I think I've always been interested in these intersections between public history and private stories, family history, and that was certainly the reason I set out to write Native Guard. I used to go down to Ship Island, which is an island stationed off the coast of my hometown, Gulfport, Mississippi, on the 4th of July every year and take a tour of the fort. And there was never any mention of the black soldiers, the Louisiana Native Guards, who were the first officially sanctioned regiment of African-American Union soldiers in the Civil War who were stationed there. And it occurred to me that that was a part of uh, our history as Americans, a, a proud history that would have been great to have known when I was growing up um, as a little girl. And so I began writing the book there. And of course, as the poet Mark Doty says, our metaphors go out ahead of us. And as I was researching and writing about this buried history, it occurred to me very late in the process that there was something else I was trying to uncover and to memorialize as well. My own mother, who had been gone for um, 20 years at that point. So I'm going to start with some of those elegiac poems. I was just talking to a young woman in the audience who's on her way to uh, Wake Forest next week on a train, her first train trip. And so I'm going to begin with a poem about a train. Um, it's called the Southern Crescent. The Southern Crescent uh, was a train that had part of its route between uh, New Orleans and Atlanta. The Southern Crescent. In 1959, my mother is boarding a train. She is barely 16, her one large grip bulging with homemade dresses, whisper of crinoline and lace, her name stitched inside each one. She is leaving behind the dirt roads of Mississippi, the film of red dust around her ankles, the thin whistle of wind through the floorboards of the shotgun house, the very idea of home. Ahead of her, days of travel, one town after the next, and California, a word she can't stop repeating. Over and over, she will practice meeting her father, imagine how he must look, how different now from the one photo she has of him. She will look at it once more, pulling into the station at Los Angeles, and then again and again on the platform, no one like him in sight. The year the old crescent makes its last run, my mother insists we ride it together. We leave Gulfport late morning, heading east. Years before, we rode together to meet another man, my father waiting for us as our train derailed. I don't recall how she must have held me, how her face sank as she realized, again, the uncertainty of it all, that trip, too, gone wrong. Today, she is sure we can leave home, bound only for whatever awaits us, the sun now setting behind us, the rails humming like anticipation, the train pulling us toward the end of another day. I watch each small town pass before my window until the light goes and the reflection of my mother's face appears, clearer now as evening comes on dark and certain. This next poem has an epigraph from Robert Herrick that reads, Fair daffodils, we weep to see you haste away so soon. Genus Narcissus. The road I walked home from school was dense with trees and shadow, creekside and lit by yellow daffodils, early blossoms bright against winter's last gray days. I must have known they grew wild, thought no harm in taking them, so I did, gathering up as many as I could hold, then presenting them in a jar to my mother. She put them on the sill, and I sat nearby, watching light bend through the glass, day easing into evening, proud of myself, forgiving my mother some small thing. 
childish vanity. I must have seen in them some measure of myself, the slender stems, each blossom a head lifted up toward praise or bowed to meet its reflection. Walking home those years ago, I knew nothing of Narcissus or the daffodil's short spring, how they dry like graveside flowers, rustling when the wind blew, a whisper treacherous from the sill. Be taken with yourself, they said to me. Die early to my mother. This next poem is a blues sonnet. Graveyard Blues. It rained the whole time we were laying her down. Rained from church to grave when we put her down. The suck of mud at our feet was a hollow sound. When the preacher called out, I held up my hand. When he called for a witness, I raised my hand. Death stops the body's work. The soul's a journeyman. The sun came out when I turned to walk away, glared down on me as I turned and walked away, my back to my mother, leaving her where she lay. The road going home was pocked with holes, that home-going road's always full of holes. Though we slow down, time's wheel still rolls. I wander now among names of the dead, my mother's name, stone pillow for my head. And this poem relies a little bit on the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. The other strange thing about it is that it's a palindrome. Myth. I was asleep while you were dying. It's as if you slip through some rift, a hollow I make between my slumber and my waking, the Erebus I keep you in, still trying not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow, but in dreams you live, so I try taking you back into morning, sleep heavy, turning, my eyes open, I find you do not follow, again and again, this constant forsaking. Again and again, this constant forsaking. My eyes open, I find you do not follow. You back into morning, sleep heavy, turning. But in dreams you live, so I try taking, not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow. The Erebus I keep you in, still trying. I make between my slumber and my waking. It's as if you slip through some rift, a hollow. I was asleep while you were dying. When I began this book many years ago, the first poem that I wrote for it, which also became the first poem in the book, was a very um, figurative poem uh, that contemplates our inability to return to those places that we've called home once we've left them behind. Not because they've changed, but because we've changed. In August of 2005, this poem became quite literal. My hometown is Gulfport, Mississippi, one of the places wiped out by Katrina. Theories of time and space. You can get there from here, though, there's no going home. Everywhere you go will be somewhere you've never been. Try this. Head south on Mississippi 49, one by one, mile markers ticking off another minute of your life. Follow this to its natural conclusion. Dead end at the coast, the pier at Gulfport where riggings of shrimp boats are loose stitches in a sky threatening rain. Cross over the man-made beach, 26 miles of sand dumped on the mangrove swamp, buried terrain of the past. Bring only what you must carry 
tome of memory its random blank pages. On the dock where you board the boat for Ship Island, someone will take your picture. The photograph, who you were, will be waiting when you return. I had to do a lot of returning to Mississippi to write this book as well, and on one of my trips, I decided that I wanted to go to um, the Vicksburg Military Park. I wanted to consider Civil War history there and um, in other places around Mississippi. And so I, I called um, one of those old antebellum mansions that's now being used as a, um, a bed and breakfast hotel, and I asked for some rooms. I was going to get a room and, and stay several nights and do research and they told me that there were several rooms in the mansion but there were also a few rooms available in the renovated uh, coach house and other small buildings in the back and I said no I'd like to be in the big house and I was and this is what happened pilgrimage Vicksburg Mississippi here, the Mississippi carved its mud-dark path, a graveyard for skeletons of sunken river boats. Here, the river changed its course, turning away from the city as one turns, forgetting from the past. The abandoned bluffs, land sloping up above the river's bend, where now the Yazoo fills the Mississippi's empty bed. Here, the dead stand up in stone, white marble on Confederate Avenue. I stand on ground once hollowed by a web of caves. They must have seemed like catacombs in 1863 to the woman sitting in her parlor, candlelit underground. I can see her listening to shells explode, writing herself into history, asking what is to become of all the living things in this place. This whole city is a grave. Every spring, pilgrimage, the living come to mingle with the dead, brush against their cold shoulders in the long hallways, listen all night to their silence and indifference, relive their dying on the green battlefield. At the museum, we marvel at their clothes, preserved under glass so much smaller than our own, as if those who wore them were only children. We sleep in their beds, the old mansions hunkered on the bluffs, draped in flowers, funereal, a blur of petals against the river's gray. The brochure in my room calls this living history. The brass plate on the door reads Prissy's room. A window frames the river's crawl toward the gulf. In my dream, the ghost of history lies down beside me, rolls over, pins me beneath a heavy arm. About 10 years ago, the state of Alabama voted whether or not to remove the anti-miscegenation laws from the books. And though the vote was uh, um, in favor of getting rid of those laws, about 40-some percent of the population voted to keep them so that at least symbolically they could say that parents like mine shouldn't be married legally and people like me born legitimately in the state. This is one of the sources of that psychological exile. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. 
Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, It's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. My mother dreams another country. Already the words are changing. She is changing from color to Negro, black still years ahead. This is 1966. She is married to a white man, and there are more names for what grows inside her. It is enough to worry about words like mongrel and the infertility of mules and mulattoes while flipping through a book of baby names. She has come home to wait out the long months, her room unchanged since she's been gone, dolls winking down from every shelf, all of them white. Every day she is flanked by the rituals of superstition, and there is a name she will learn for this too, maternal impression, the shape like an unknown country marking the back of the newborn's thigh. For now, women tell her to clear her head, to steady her hands, or she'll gray a lock of the child's hair wherever she worries her own, imprint somewhere the outline of a thing she craves too much. They tell her to staunch her cravings by eating dirt. All spring she is sat on her hands, her fingers numb. For a while each day she can't feel anything she touches. The arbor out back, the landscape's green tangle, the molehill of her own swelling. Here, outside the city limits, cars speed by, clouds of red dust in their wake. She breathes it in, Mississippi, then drifts towards sleep, thinking of some place she's never been. Late, Mississippi is a dark backdrop bearing down on the windows of her room. On the TV in the corner, the station signs off, broadcasting its nightly salutation, the waving stars and stripes, our national anthem. Southern Gothic. I have lain down into 1970, into the bed my parents will share for only a few more years. Early evening, they have not yet turned from each other in sleep, their bodies curved, parentheses framing the separate lives they'll wake to. Dreaming, I am again the child with too many questions, the endless why and why and why my mother cannot answer, her mouth closed, a gesture toward her future, cold lips stitched shut. The lines in my young father's face deepen toward an expression of grief. I have come home from the schoolyard with the words that shadow us in this small southern town. Peckerwood and nigger lover, half-breed and zebra, words that take shape outside us. We're huddled on the tiny island of bed, quiet in the language of blood. The house, unsteady on its cinder block haunches, sinking deeper into the muck of ancestry. Oil lamps flicker around us, our shadows, dark glyphs on the wall, bigger and stranger than we are. This poem has an epigraph from Alan Tate's Ode to the Confederate Dead that reads, Now that the salt of their blood stiffens the saltier oblivion of the sea. Elegy for the Native Guards. We leave Gulfport at noon.
gulls overhead trailing the boat, streamers, noisy fanfare, all the way to Ship Island. What we see first is the fort, its roof of grass, a lee, half reminder of the men who served there, a weathered monument to some of the dead. Inside we follow the ranger, hurried though we are to get to the beach. He tells of graves lost in the gulf, the island split in half when Hurricane Camille hit, shows us casemates, cannons, the store that sells souvenirs, tokens of history long buried. The Daughters of the Confederacy has placed a plaque here at the fort's entrance, each Confederate soldier's name raised hard in bronze, no names carved for the Native Guards, Second Regiment, Union Men, Black Phalanx. What is monument to their legacy? All the grave markers, all the crude headstones, water lost, now fish dart among their bones, and we listen for what the waves intone. Only the fort remains, near forty feet high, round, unfinished, half open to the sky, the elements, wind, rain, God's deliberate eye. I'm going to finish up now with three poems. This is Monument. Today the ants are busy beside my front steps, weaving in and out of the hill they're building. I watch them emerge and, like everything I've forgotten, disappear into the subterranean, a world made by displacement. In the cemetery last June, I circled, lost, weeds and grass grown up all around, the landscape blurred and waving. At my mother's grave, ants streamed in and out like arteries, a tiny hill rising above her untended plot. Bit by bit, red dirt piled up, spread like a rash on the grass. I watched a long time the ants' determined work, how they brought up soil of which she will be part and piled it before me. Believe me when I say I tried not to begrudge them their industry, this reminder of what I haven't done. Even now, the mound is a blister on my heart, a red and humming swarm. Incident We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows Shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shades drawn, at the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered, white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our rooms and lit hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had all dimmed. When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. And this last poem has an epigraph from E.O. Wilson that reads, Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. South. I return to a stand of pines, Bone-thin phalanx flanking the roadside, tangle of understory, a dialectic of dark and light, and magnolias blossoming like afterthought, each flower a surrender, white flags draped among the branches. 
I return to land's end, the swath of coast clear-cut and buried in sand, mangrove, live oak, gulf weed raised and replaced by thin palms, palmettos, symbols of victory or defiance, over and over, marking this vanquished land. I returned to a field of cotton, hallowed ground as slave legend goes, each bowl holding the ghosts of generations, those who measured their days by the heft of sacks and lengths of rows, who sweat, flecked the cotton plants, still sewn into our clothes. I returned to a country battlefield where colored troops fought and died, Port Hudson, where their bodies swelled and blackened beneath the sun, unburied until earth's green sheet pulled over them, unmarked by any headstones. Where the roads, buildings, and monuments are named to honor the Confederacy, where that old flag still hangs, I return to Mississippi, state that made a crime of me, mulatto, half-breed, native, in my native land, this place, they'll bury me. Thank you. Do you know the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice? Okay. Uh, well, that's one of the things. Who does know that myth? Uh, whenever I say that, I'm assuming most people know what I'm talking about. Well, you probably do know it, but maybe you're forgetting the name of it. But that's the myth in which um, Orpheus has to go down into the underworld to bring Eurydice back. And he's told that he can take her out, but he can't turn around and look at her. She's going to follow him out of the underworld, but if he turns around and looks at her, she's going to vanish just like that. And at some point... He can't resist turning around and looking at her, and he does, and she goes back. Um, for me, that very much replicates the feeling of the dream a dream that I might have if, knowing that my mother is dead, I dream that she's alive. I mean, there's some dreams where she's clearly dead in the dream, and I know it, but there's a few dreams that she's alive in the dream, and it seems so real. And then I wake up, and there's that moment of, realization all over again that she's really dead and it the grief is fresh and it's very much to me like that moment when Orpheus turns around and she goes that way and he goes back out and so the poem goes all the way in until it gets to that one point and then as I begin to wake up I turn she goes back and I come awake and so in order for the poem that sort of seamless balance between um, form and content the form really kind of echoes that feeling of going down into that dream world, that Erebus, that underworld, and then retreating and returning every morning without her. Yes. Mm -hmm. I found out long after most of the world, it seemed, because um, they announce it. Um, on, they don't tell you if you're a finalist or anything like that. They just announce it on their website at, I guess, 3 o'clock, and it goes out to all the reporters. And um, I teach a class on Mondays from 2 to 5, and so at 2 o'clock I turned off my cell phone, walked into class, and reporters started calling me but they couldn't reach me and so finally they started calling the um, English department and creative writing and so at about 4.30 um, the the administrator in the creative writing program ran over to my building and said I gotta take you out of class to tell you something and she said that the look on my face was you know sheer terror or something and she said no no it's 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 good and uh, so I walked out and she took a couple of deep breaths and and then she said, you won the Pulitzer, and I screamed. And it was a kind of blood-curdling scream that made my students think that something bad had happened. <laughs> and she had to go in there and say, um, no, no, she won the Pulitzer. And then they started applauding. And then I walked back in class and said, class dismissed. And so <laughs> but, that was, but apparently, and then I, I immediately called my husband, and then I called my father. I couldn't get my father on the phone because he had left his office. Um, and I got him another hour after that. And he said, oh, my God, everybody had been emailing him saying congratulations, but nobody was telling him why. They just figured he would know. So congratulations, but no, no reason why.
Yes. Well, I mean, I think it's it's all for both, really. Um, you know, I, I like Phil Levine says, I write what I've been given to write. And I think I have these histories and these stories um, to make sense of, to grapple with. Um, but I have to do it in such a way that it moves beyond something that's simply for me, but that's something I can give away in language to a reader um, who I hope, you know, across time and space will find something there. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the thing that's most difficult is hearing myself read them out loud. Because um, they're, I mean, I, I, I like the poems, I do. <laughs> they mean a lot to me, but um, I, it's not, I don't think, um, you know, I can never predict when um, I'm going to feel a fresh grief. I don't know that. Um, and I can go, you know, several readings and, and not feel, you know, anything except how I'm trying to make the language sound like a song as I read it. But there would be moments for some reason that something um, would, uh, would get to me. Um, I mean, to tell you the truth, and I, I, I'll, I'll say this just for the sake of honesty, but um, the, the, the first time I heard someone say it, and, and uh, Professor Bird actually said it uh, tonight, too, and it always sort of causes me to, a little bit of catch in my throat. But I gave a reading not too long ago, and, and in the introduction, um, the young woman who was introducing me said that, you know, there are these themes in the book, and, and one of them is that I, I revisit the, the murder of my mother. And I really feel like um, in the poems, I'm actually revisiting my own grief and not the murder. They're, they're not about the murder, but that's sort of a thing that's been out there and people have been saying it occasionally. I, I liked what you said because then you added to it and the murder of the, these black soldiers as well. And so that kind of tied it together in another way. But to hear that word for me, um, that's not, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, right, right. Mm-hmm. You want to tell me? You want to tell me a theory? <laughs> okay. So wait a minute. If I if I say what it's about, is this going to affect your grade? <laughs> well, um, one of the things that I try to make clear in the in the poem is that because um, that it has that title, "You Are Late," and those are the last lines too. Um, that's actually there. There are two signs that the, the in the photograph as the girl is walking up to the stairs, and one is an uh, you know this uh, the sign on the door of the library, and the other is a sign with a finger that says "You're late." And so it's like the, the library's closed somehow, you know, she doesn't have any access to it. And so looking at that photograph and sort of knowing, you know, the history of Jim, the Jim Crow era um, in the South, you know, there's a, obviously a part of me that would wishes that I could go back and, and, and right the wrongs of history. But um, we're all too late to history. The one thing we can't do is return to it and right the wrongs of the past, except in this present moment. Um, somebody asked me last week, you know, oh, you always write about the past, do you ever write about the present? And I said, I'm always writing about the present. Um, so yeah, it's about being late, you know, to history. Um, is that one of your theories? All right. <laughs> All right, good. I'm so glad to know that. <laughs> good, good. Well, you... <laughs> You've been a most gracious audience. Thank you.